فنعوذ بها وذروا الذين يلحدون في أسمائه سيجزون ما كانوا يعملون Uh, the next time we will look at, inshallah, is Al-Hafiz or al hafiz which is on page 18. Um, al hafiz um, There's another name of Allah similar to that, which is al hafiz al hafiz Now, <coughs> Sheikh Sa'adi explains it in the following way. The one who protects and preserves what he created and whose knowledge encompasses all that he brought into existence. The one who protects his friends from falling into sins and the destructive matters. The one who is kind to them during their periods of activity and rest. The one who accounts the actions of the servants and their rewards. And then he quoted the verse and he believes did prove true um, his thought about them and they followed him. All except the group of the true believers, and the police have no authority over them, except that we might test um, he who believes in the hereafter from him who is in doubt about it, and your Lord is the guardian over everything. Another verse, as for those who take friends and protectors besides him, Allah is the guardian over them, and you are not a disposer of their affairs. Now, we're going to come back to this explanation of Saudi because... Uh, it's a very far explanation of it. Now, al hafiz itself, it's been mentioned three times in the Qur'an. As for the name al hafiz then this has been mentioned once. Both names, al hafiz and al hafiz they both originate from the word hifz. Hafadha, hafidha. Now, hifz, we, 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 we're used to hearing this term to refer to memorizing the Qur'an. Okay, someone who's hafiz, okay, usually mispronounced as hafiz, okay, is actually hafiz. Someone who's a memorizer of the Quran, you say hafiz. Uh, I mean, hafiz is a more intensive form, but we, we don't usually use it for someone who's memorized the Quran. And linguistically, it, it literally means to, to guard something. That's why they've translated it here as a guardian. And why is that the case? Why is a Hafiz of Qur'an called a guardian? Because he has guarded the Qur'an and preserved it in his memory, preventing it from leaving him. Preventing it from leaving him. So he's guarded that Qur'an within him. And as we know, Rasulullah described the Qur'an as being ashaddu tafallutan. That it is something that, that leaves us very quickly, like a camel, which has not been tied. If you don't tie a camel, what will happen? The, the camel will just run off. The Qur'an is like that when it comes to memorizing. If you don't constantly revise your Qur'an, what will happen? You'll forget it. You'll forget it. Okay? So, from a linguistic perspective, it, 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 it is used to refer to preserving and safeguarding something. Therefore, how do we apply this to Allah? How do we apply this to Allah? He is the one who preserves and safeguards um, the universe and what is in it. That's the first thing. He preserves and safeguards the universe. He sustains the universe. So there's a meaning of Samad here. <coughs> okay, he preserves it. I mean, just look at the universe itself, the way the planets they orbit around the sun. Perfect system. You can clearly see there's someone controlling all of that. But more importantly for the believer, he is the one who preserves and safeguards his servants. How does he preserve and safeguard his servants? From what in particular? From two things, two destructive forces. The first is the destructive forces of, 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 of desires, shahawat. He protects him from them. 
and he also protects them from shubuhat, those doubtful grey areas, concepts and ideas that can corrupt your aqidah, your belief. He protects you from those matters. And these are the two things that lead mankind astray. A person, people's desires and people's thoughts. So Al-Hafif or Al-Hafif is the one who protects you and preserves you from those two destructive elements. But in order to attain this hiv, this preservation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a person must do his role in that. And his role is to preserve the boundaries of Allah. When you preserve the boundaries of Allah, Allah will preserve you. And this is based upon the hadith, Rasulullah said, and this is when he taught Abdullah ibn Abbas, who was very young. And this is a, a very important lesson for us as, as murabbis and educators and, and parents. Uh, Rasulullah told Ibn Abbas, who was very young at that time, Preserve, very literally preserve or safeguard Allah, but it means preserve the boundaries of Allah, Allah will preserve you. That preserve the boundaries of Allah and you will find Allah in front of you. And know that if the whole Ummah was to come together to, 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 to harm you, Okay, they will not be able to harm you unless Allah had willed. And if the whole Ummah came to try and benefit you, they will not be able to benefit you unless Allah had willed. The pens have been lifted and the ink has dried and know that victory comes uh, with sabr. Look, look at these concepts he's speaking about. He's speaking to a child. SubhanAllah. He's speaking to a child about victory and sabr. You know, the closest we get to talking about victory is on a computer game, you know, with children. He's speaking about these, these important topics, and that's why one of the problems that we have is that um, sometimes we, we belittle our children and think that they don't understand these important topics. Okay? And, you know, our children are becoming, they're, they're, we're dumbing our children down. You know, we have this, we have children, we have. Children who, you know, they're considered children at a young age and then become teenagers and then they become adults. In some, we don't have that. You're either a child or you're an adult, that's it. So in your teenage years, and that's the most destructive years you'll find for children, because they're being fed that they are teenagers. That's what they're being, they're being told, you're a teenager. And when, you go, when you're in your teenage years, you suffer from a lot of difficulties. They even told that, you know, your, your hormones, they play about with you. If you're being told that, you're going to behave in that way. You're going, to be, you're going to behave in that way. And there's a stereotypical image of teenagers nowadays. When people speak about them, they're rebellious, they're this and that. If teenagers see this, this is how they're going to be. But if you treat them as adults, when they become mature, they will behave in that way. And that's how the Sahaba were. Rasulullah said, Usama ibn Zayd, as a leader of an army at the age of 17. <coughs> at the age of 17, he was a leader of an army, subhanAllah. So, you know, we should be imparting this type of knowledge to our young adults. Okay? We should speak to them on serious terms and, you know, make them understand that they are now responsible for their actions. It's not when you become 18 that you're responsible. No, when you're 12, 13, 14, that's when you become responsible for your actions. You are now a man. You're a woman at that age. Um, so anyway, <coughs> going back to the hadith, preserve the boundaries of Allah and Allah will preserve you. So in order to attain Allah's preservation, you must preserve the boundaries of Allah. And there are certain things that the Islam in particular, um, encourages the preservation of. What acts of ibadah in particular does Allah focus on when it comes to preservation in the Quran? As salah. Hafidhu ala salati. Preserve your salah, or salat al wusta, and the middle prayer in particular, which is salat al asr. 
as many scholars say, And this is why the scholars and the Rasul used to say, the one who doesn't pray his asr, it's as if he's lost all of his wealth and all of his family. If you miss that one salah. Now what does that mean? Imagine the regret and the remorse you will have and the sadness that you will have if you came home and you found all of your wealth and all of your family gone. How would you feel? Gutted. SubhanAllah. On the Day of Judgment, that is how you will feel when you find out you missed one Salat al Asr. Imagine years of that, SubhanAllah. So, Salat is something very, very important to preserve. Very, very important to preserve. Also, um, the scholars would mention preserving um, the, your, your private parts, preserving your stomach and preserving your intellect. These are the key things that a person needs to be consciously aware of what he needs to protect and to guard. For example, Rasulullah used to say, whoever can guarantee, um, can guarantee for me that which is between his two jaw bones and between his two legs, i.e. His, his tongue and his private part, if you can guarantee those things for me, I will guarantee Jannah for you. I will guarantee Jannah for you. Preserving the stomach from intaking haram sustenance. Overeating, etc. Preserving the intellect from taking in corrupt thoughts or becoming drunk. These are very, very important things to preserve. If you can preserve those things and preserve yourself from yourself according to haram, Allah will preserve you. And Allah preserves you in one of two ways. And this is something we've spoken about before. But He can preserve you on a very basic level, which is the preservation Allah gives even to many, you know, not many non-Muslims even. This is when he takes care of your, um, your, your health, your physical state, okay? And your provisions, etc. And he does that, as I said, even to many non Muslims. And there was a very famous story of Imam Abu Tayyib al Tabari, who I think I mentioned this story before. He was a very old shaykh and you know, reached 100 years. He was walking with his students one day. He came across a hole in the floor and he jumped over the hole. He jumped over, and the student said, why are you jumping over the whole ship? Be careful, you're an old man. He said, no, these limbs of mine, these limbs of mine, I preserved them from haram when I was young. So Allah preserved them for me when I became old. Okay? So Allah even preserved, and that's why you find, and I, and I always mention this, that you know, the greatest scholars of Islam, they literally taught until the day they died. Okay, many of us, you know, once we reach the age of, you know, we become an old age pensioner, you know, everything slows down, you know, we stop doing the things that we generally tend to do, okay? We can't perform ibadah like we used to when we were young. But if you really preserved yourself when you were young, Allah will give you that strength and ability, you know, so I remember one, one of my teachers, he was, uh, he was in his 70s. And the, the class that we would have, we sometimes used to be on the, the fourth floor of a building. He would race me to the top of the stairs at the age of 70. And he used to beat me. <laughs> so he had that much energy, subhanAllah. So I was like, you know, panting when I got to the top. But you see that. And, you know, the, there was a clip of Sheikh Al-Hasaymin, uh, you know, just a few days before he passed away. And he was teaching in the Haram, in Mecca. And you could even hear it in his voice that his life is leaving him gradually. But he's still teaching. He's still teaching. He was still teaching, subhanAllah. And not only that, Allah doesn't just preserve you, but He preserves your family as well, based on your preservation of His religion. If <coughs> when we look to the story of Musa and Khidr in the Quran, we know that they passed by, uh, you know, they had, there was a number of incidences there. One of them was though, that they came across a, a group of people who were very, um, uh, they, were, they were not very hospitable. So Musa and Khidr, they came and you know, they wanted to be taken in, but they weren't very hospitable. And so Khidr, um, he saw there was a wall that was broken and he wanted to rebuild the wall. But without, obviously, they aren't very hospitable, so they don't want to pay him for anything. So Musa said to him, look, these people, they treated you so badly. Why are you doing it for free? So Khidr, he responded and he said, underneath essentially this wall, there's treasure. 
Okay, and it belongs to two orphans. But what did he say? Wakana Abu Salihan Farada Rabbuk. That their father was a righteous man. These two people, these two young orphans, their father was a righteous man. So Allah wanted to preserve that wealth of theirs underneath that wall until they became old. So when they became old, they'll be able to extract the, the treasure. Whereas if the wall was broken, people could just scatter around and they would, they would find the, and the, the treasure would come up. But the key thing was, is what? What did he de describe their father as being righteous? So because of the righteousness of the father, the children were preserved. Because of the righteousness of the father, the children were preserved. So that's one of the benefits of preserving the boundaries of Allah. But the second and the most noblest form of, the more noble form of preservation is when Allah he preserves not just your health and your wealth and your provisions, is that when He preserves your deen. He preserves your deen. And that is what the, 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 the more significant meaning of Al Hafid is He protects you. The other day, subhanAllah, I was, uh, uh, I was speaking to my wife about um, you know, some of the problems that a lot of sisters face nowadays. And there's one of her friends which uh, she's going through a lot of hardship. And she's the only practicing person in her family. Okay. And you know, her brothers are like drug users and you know, the house get raided. Their house, her house gets raided all the time by police and you know, subhanAllah, what a difficult circumstance to be in. Yeah. And then you reflect, you think, subhanAllah, look at our situation. Look how easy it is for us to pray, to fast, to do these things. And then you have people that live in an environment like that. And they struggle just to perform the basic acts of ibadah. So really, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes things a lot easy for us. It makes things very, very easy for us. And that's something we should really appreciate. And that's why whenever... Um, uh, you end up performing the ibadah, you need to be grateful to the fact that Allah has given you that tawfiq. Okay, really it requires a lot of gratitude to Allah. That the fact that you are able to perform these acts of ibadah. Now, <coughs> another manifestation of Allah's um, hifz is that he preserves the, the, the deeds of the righteous and the evildoers. وَإِنَّ عَلَيْكُمْ لَحَافِظِينَ كِرَامًا كَاتِبِينَ Allah even describes one of the uh, characteristics of the angels as being حَافِظِينَ Protectors or guardians or people who keep a watch over you because they write down your deeds. Now, that could be viewed in two ways, because if you're righteous, then this instills hope in you, because you know that the deeds that you're doing will not go to waste, because Allah has preserved those deeds of yours. They will never go to waste. And this is actually what happened with the Sahaba. They were worried at one stage that we're doing all of these good deeds, but we don't see them recorded anywhere. So what will happen to our deeds? So Allah revealed what as a response? What surah did Allah reveal? Qad aflaha al-mu'minun And we usually translate that as successful indeed are the believers. But that's not what it really means. And when we use the word qad in the Arabic language, one of the meanings it conveys that of tahqiq, which is actualization, meaning the believers have already achieved success. So you don't need to worry. Allah is aware of your deeds. He knows what you're doing. So this gives hope to the believer. But at the same time, it also instills fear for those who commit sin. Because Allah is not nasiya. He is not someone who forgets. All your sins will be recorded down. So knowing that Allah is hafid instills hope for the righteous, but it instills fear in the hearts of those who commit sins and transgress against Him. Allah does not forget. Not like human beings. With human beings, sometimes we forget the mistakes of other people and the sins that people commit. And this is one of the problems with, with human beings, is that sometimes, you know, we've committed many, many sins years ago. Okay, and they're just in the back of our memories. We've committed those sins in the back of our memories. And, you know, we tend to belittle those sins. 
Because we think, oh, we've done that many, many years ago, that was many years ago. But no, Allah doesn't forget. Allah subhanahu wa doesn't forget. He, he, and he will remind you every single action that you did, all of his actions were preserved. And this is why the human being is described as being valuman. He's described as being someone who's unjust to his own self. Because he does wrong to himself, but then he carries on as if he hasn't done any wrong. And that's the person destroying himself. Okay, the effects of knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al hafiz <clears throat> Firstly, the person, um, and this is something which we mentioned, but we'll briefly point to. Firstly, the, 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 the person himself will um, be more conscious of preserving the boundaries of Allah because he knows that Allah will preserve him as a result of that. And, and he preserves him in two ways as we know. Um, also, uh, one of the things that Allah preserves as well is um, the Qur'an. Verily, we have sent down this reminder, this Qur'an, and verily we shall preserve it. So the Qur'an is free from being tampered from, with. It will not be changed, it will not be altered, will, nothing will be added to it, nothing will be subtracted from it. Allah has preserved it. So that instills in a believer a sense of... Uh, okay. Okay, it instills even a, a, a person, a, a strong iman, knowing that Allah will preserve the, the Quran itself. One of the du'as of Rasulullah was, uh, was related to him. Allah mahfazni min baynaydi. Oh Allah, protect me and safeguard me from in front of me, wa min khalfi, from behind me, from, from behind me, wa an yameni, wa an shamali. From Shimali and from my right and from my and, and, and my left, from in Fauqi and protect me from above. So the, this is one of the things that we should try and incorporate with, within our supplications. Allah protect us, safeguard us. Allah muhafazni. Okay, and this is a phrase that we usually say when referring to people of knowledge. When they, when, you know, when someone's passed away, we refer to them as. Rahimahullah, may Allah have mercy upon him. If he's alive, Hafidahullah, may Allah preserve him, may Allah protect him. That's not just for people of knowledge. Okay? That should be for every believer, for yourself. Okay, make that dua for yourself. Allahumma hafazni. Just a simple dua. Allahumma hafazni. Allahumma ihfazni. Oh Allah, protect me, uh, protect my iman, protect my health, etc. Okay, that's, uh, we'll stop at that for al Hafiz. The, the next name that I want to discuss, we'll probably take some time, so we'll really um, do half of it now, which is al razzaq the provider, which in your notes it's on, ah, I forgot to, sorry, just to go back to um, uh, what Shah Sa'di said about al Hafiz. let's just read that again. <coughs> <coughs> the one who protects and preserves what he created, and whose knowledge encompasses all that he brought into existence. The one who protects his friends from falling into sins and destructive matters. So the destructive matters are related to desires and doubts, as we said. And the one who's kind to them during their periods of activity and rest. And that's really interesting. Um, the one who is kind to them during their periods of activity and rest. Now, human beings, they suffer from weaknesses and times where they're not feeling very, very strong. Those moments are, um, are a critical point for the believer because that is when it's very likely that a person can fall into sin. It's very likely for the person to fall into sin. That's why it's very important that you have that protection from Allah during those moments of uh, rest. And that's why Rasulullah said that um, once the companions complained to him, that, you know, when we are with you, O oh, Rasulullah, you know, we feel as though, you know, we are walking in the gardens of Jannah. When we go back to our families, you know, we are reminded of the dunya, etc. 
Rasulullah said, if you can remain in that same state when you are with me, the angels will come and they will shake your hands. If you can remain in that state. But there is a time for this and there is a time for that. Meaning that to achieve that state, I mean, for example, when we're in the masjid here, our iman is, is rise, you know, we, we are remembering Allah. We go home, you know, we get tempted by the dunya. To remain in the same state, it's something very difficult to ask. It is very, very difficult. If you can achieve that state, then alhamdulillah. But there is a time for this and there is a time for that. Okay? So, the person needs to have moments of recreation, but the important thing is he doesn't fall into haram. He doesn't fall into haram when he has those moments of recreation and play and amusement. And this is really important for the youth. Now, something that um, uh, a lot of people ask, uh, maybe it's not pertaining to everyone sitting here, but people who are very keen on seeking knowledge, one of the, 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 the things that they ask is, you know, should I get married now or should I get married later? Because the scholars of the past, they would actually encourage um, you know, students of knowledge to get married when they were really late. Like Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah, Ahmad ibn Hanbal, uh, he was 40 years old when he got married. That's, that's quite old, okay? And so they would, you know, people would discourage, scholars would discourage students of knowledge, serious students of knowledge from getting married. Because why? They need to dedicate all of their time to seeking knowledge. But the youth of today, are not that, they're not of that calibre. We have to make that clear because they, no matter how much eagerness they have to seek knowledge, they will not spend their entire day, their entire days and nights seeking knowledge. They will read a book for a few hours a day, and that will be all. So, what are they going to do with the rest of their time? What are you going to be doing the rest of the day? You need to be making sure you're not falling into sin, because as soon as you have that free time, that's when the doors of shaitan they open to you. Okay, so being preserved, Allah to preserve you in times of uh, 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 inactivity is extremely, extremely important. And you need to be consciously aware that when you don't have many things to do, that's when shaitan is going to work very, very hard with you. Very, very hard with you. And so, you know, to, to make you fall and to slip and to fall into hell. Okay, so the next...